So I want to thank Jake um, Edelstein for being our first guest as part of this series. Um, for those of you who don't know who Jake is, um, Nat's going to give a quick intro to him and then we'll get into the questions. So our very special guest, Jake Edelstein, is an investigative journalist, um, due diligence investigator, author of three books and very soon to be four, and a Buddhist priest. I might have to ask you a bit more about that later on. So Jake, you moved from Missouri, US to Japan 30 years ago, right? Um, you became the first foreigner, the first gaijin uh, to ever work in um, one of Japan's largest daily newspapers, the Yomuri Shinbun. Hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, you are pronouncing and correctly. for nearly 30 years, you've been covering organized crime in Japan. Just flip it up. Um, yes, yeah. that's all correct. You got it. And then you ended up pissing off a Yakuza boss. <laughs> Go to uh, Ta Tadamasa during your investigations and uh, that led you to write Tokyo Vice, which has now been adapted into an HBO TV series, which I've seen. It's amazing. Um, Thank you. So yeah, uh, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into that. And uh, tell me, Jake, you moved to Japan when you were 19. Why, why Japan and how did you become a crime reporter? Okay. Um First, let me say thank you to having me here. Um, thank you, Jacob, who can't be with us. Um, it's a pleasure to be here for the first of what will hopefully be um, an annual event for you guys. Um, I don't know if I'm inspirational. Uh, there's a Japanese word called Hanmen Kyoshi, which means the person who teaches by their terrible example. So um, if I'm an example of things you shouldn't do as a reporter, uh, definitely, I, I definitely could be an example in that way. I got interested in the martial arts, especially karate, in high school. And when I had a chance to study in Japan in the year abroad program, um, I took it. Actually, technically, I shouldn't have been allowed to go because we were supposed to have two years of Japanese, and I only had one year of Japanese. But this was like 1988, and the Japanese economy was like taking over the world. And the yen was very expensive, and so we had 20 students coming from Sophia University. We had no one going from the University of Missouri. So in a, a moment of early negotiating brilliance, I said, well, it's not an exchange if you have people coming and we don't have anyone going, so I'll go. And so I got to go. Uh, and we took one for the team. <laughs> so you were the first non-Japanese reporter in the newspaper. What was that experience like? Uh, it was really interesting because I, I didn't, you know, I. I actually had a job lined up with Sony. Um, in Japan, I don't know if you're aware of this, but usually like, you start looking for a job in your last or your second year of school. And if you're lucky, you get what's called a night day. So you have a promise to, you know, that when, you know, after you graduate, you have a job. So I had one of those with Sony. Um, and I was really taking the newspaper examination, to, you know, just to make, my, make myself study Japanese harder. And, um, and then when they offered me the job, I was like, well, well, you know, that's a lot more interesting than working for Sony. Um, so I said yes. And ironically, this year I have been working for Sony <laughs> um, on a podcast. So Full there circle. you go. 30, 34 years later. So I was speaking to Sayaka earlier and she was sharing that usually when you start your career um, at a publication, you start when, within the crime beat. Is that how you started? Yeah. Everybody starts on the crime beat because that's the basics of who did what, when, where, why, to whom, how. Um, so uh, almost without exception, if you're a reporter in Japan, you're gonna spend the first year covering crime. Moving to Japan in general is quite a cultural shock for most people, but as a 19 year old from Missouri, probably even more so, even though you did speak a little bit of the language, what was it like moving there um, at that age? And how did you deal with the culture shock? Um, how challenging was it to integrate yourself into Japanese culture? Wow. Um, who here has been to Japan? I mean, how many people have been to Japan? Raise your hand. Okay. So, I mean, you have a passing familiarity with Japan. I, I mean, I didn't go blind. I read some books, you know, about anthropological studies, but what I quickly learned is that if you're going to speak Japanese correctly, you have to accept the Japanese worldview, which is that we are not equal. Like nobody's equal. Somebody's either above you or they're below you. Maybe you're kind of on the same level, but you have to change the way you speak and the pronouns you use and the terms of address 
whether I call you Kun or Chan or Sama, or if I really want to insult you, I don't even add an honorific to you at all, which is probably the worst thing you can do to someone is you know drop everything, which is called yobiste. And so, you know, to to speak Japanese correctly, you have to accept the Japanese worldview, which is you know that we're not equal. It's you know for an American, it's a little hard because we have that pretense that we're all equal, we're all the same. Um, but in Japan, that's not there, and the levels of who's above and who's below can change within a circle or within a company. Um, but fortunately for me, uh, within like three months of being there, I ended up living in this Zen Buddhist temple, and the, the chief priest there, Ryogen, was very, very nice, um, but also was very much like, okay, this is how things are done in Japan. You need to do things this way. Um, and, you know, living in a completely Japanese environment where I was expected to behave well, um, Help me acclimate very, very quickly. So I guess you, you learned the easy way, not necessarily by like making mistakes and making a fool of yourself. Or no, was there uh, no, of did? course I, I made mistakes and made. made I, I still make a make a fool of myself. You know, I there's some, like a, a phrase I used for years, and my and my and my friend say, you know, when you put the O in front of it, the meaning is completely different. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, well, it's nice to know that 30 years later. So, uh, you, you know, you, you learn by trial and error. Um, you know, Japanese is a very difficult language, even for Japanese people, which is why a lot of uh, a lot of like books for children have the, the pronunciation written next to the kanji, because otherwise, how would kids know? Let's move shift gears a little bit. Let's talk about your time as a reporter. Um, I guess the question is, how is media reporting different in Japan compared to maybe around the world? Um, and I guess. The, the backstory, maybe the pretense of, behind that is that you've been quite critical about how media in Japan or journalists in Japan approach you know, tough stories or anything that approaches scandal. Um, in general, they seem to shy away from it and not really follow leads or stories to their logical end or report on things that could be you know, negative for, for the government or things like that. So, well, well, one thing is that in Japan, um, until recently, reporters didn't get, for newspapers, didn't get a byline. So you write the article and your name isn't attached to it. Now, the, there's two reasons for that. One reason is that, um, if you, maybe three reasons. If you attach someone's name to an article, um, it's easier to figure out who there's their source. So there's a source protection element. Um, there's also an element of, you know, making it harder to be sued. You can't, if you can't name the reporter, you can't sue that reporter. You can just sue the newspaper. And the third is that, um, if you have a reporter who's writing really good articles and scoop after scoop, they might be headhunted by the competition and you don't want that. So you don't want to have star reporters. So that's Japan's system. Um, there was a time when Japan was number 11 in world press freedom ranking about 2011. But the disaster in Fukushima, followed by the return of Abe Shinzo on the LDP, really crushed press freedom in Japan. And over time, through bullying and losing readers and um, intimidation and also um, the Prime Minister wined and dined all the heads of the media organizations like if you look at a schedule it's like sushi with the head of Nikkei you know, uh, you know pizza with the head of the Omidi Shimbun you know his, his schedule is like all these top dogs in the media he's smoozing with and then whenever someone writes critical things about them are as critical on the airwaves so they were quickly removed um, through political pressure or um, sponsorship pressure so the Japanese media has become afraid of its own shadow um, they weren't always that cowardly um, but uh, I think they've really been kicked in the face many times over the last year there's still some very good publications um, Bunshun, Tokyo Shimbun, uh, Shukan Shincho they're really good investigative journalism so I wouldn't want to say all the Japanese media is bad it's just a lot of the major media has really become kind of chicken shit you think that's going to change? Uh, I think that's going to change because I see that uh, with um, Shinzo Kun departing to the other world um, and no one really having the same Machiavellian uh, ability to keep the press in check, they might run loose for a while. So moving back on to the fun part, <laughs> which is your investigations, you know, which led you to write Tokyo Vice. What I really want to know is what exactly you did to piss off that Yakuza boss. Oh, oh well. Um, actually, we, we sort of have him here. I'll pass this around. Uh, this is the cover of a Yakuza fanzine, and yes, 
Yakuza in Japan used to have fanzines. Um, this one went out of business in like 2017 or 2018, mostly because of police pressure. That's him on the cover. Um, I'll pass it around. It's kind of interesting. Um, later, you got to come explain to you what all the various things are. That's an article about uh, when he got kicked out, a whole bunch of other Yakuza got from the Yamaguchi Gumi got kicked out as well. Uh, basically, um, kind of giving away the plot of the book, but uh, he made a deal um, in which he ratted out his fellow Yakuza to save his own ass, and that didn't go over very well, and he didn't want anyone writing about it, because generally speaking, in every mafia in the world, when you betray your fellow mafiosa, they're not happy. Um, and uh, since I was trying to write about it, and he figured out that I was trying to write about it before I finished, uh, I got some death threats and I got put under police protection. But once the article was out, um, I felt a lot safer. And then just to make sure that everything went well, there was this book published at the end of 2008 with all the details, including the names of three other Yakuza who got um, liver transplants in the United States. And uh, I think that pretty much finished him off. Um, I sent a copy to a couple top people in his organization just to make sure that you know they had a read um, bookmarked. So, can you recount any particular incident where you know it was especially sort of I guess life threatening? Um, I see you still have all your ten fingers, which is nice. <laughs> it is. It is. It is. You know, only yakuza get to chop off their fingers. I don't think I could offer a finger, um, and I don't think it would do me much good because I'm, I'm not a yakuza, so it wouldn't have much meaning. Um, uh, I, I guess really the you know the closest I felt like wow I have really uh, like this might be how my life ends was um, was doing reporting for the U.S. State Department. The U.S. State Department sponsored a study of human trafficking in Japan, and I was in this Russian club in Ikebukuro, and I was talking to one of the girls, and the bouncer realized that you know I was a reporter and not a customer, and he took me out in the hall and um, like basically. I mean, it was huge. He picked me up and pinned me to the wall, and and I was like choking me. And I was thinking, "Wow, I'm not gonna die." And then I and I remembered what my Aikido teacher told me, like in a flash, which is, you know, the best Aikido move is atemi, which is you hit somebody in the throat. And so I did as hard as I could. And you know, people can't beat you up if they can't breathe. And so once he, you know, let me go, I. Um, wrapped my hands on his head really hard so I think I broke his eardrums and I kneed him in the face and then I ran really far and kept running until I got on the subway um, and that was a moment I felt like you know if I'm gonna do this in the future I need to have a backup plan or I need to have somebody waiting outside for me to call the police it was a good a good, a good learning moment you when we were speaking earlier you said that there was a period of time where you wouldn't have your back towards the door or you would always be almost paranoid um, can you just talk through what, what did that feel like? What was that like for you? Um, how did you? How have you moved away from that? And like you know, living more of a normal life now. Well, for a time, and I talk about this in Tokyo Vice and and uh, and in this book called The Last of the Yakuza, which has only been published in French, but will be probably published in English this year. I, I may announce it very soon. I'm still working out the details, but it looks like it's definitely going to happen. I hired an ex Yakuza um, from the Inagawa Kai to be my to be my bodyguard and driver. Um, did he have 10 fingers? Or? No, he did not. Uh, he had nine and a half fingers. Nine and three, back, nine and three fourths, it depends. It's, you know, he didn't really cut it right here where he should have. I think he kind of overdid it. Um, and you know, uh, and he had still buddies in the Yakuza. Uh, so I felt a, mo a lot safer. Um, and then uh, I think, uh, this is all in my fourth book, Tokyo Private Eye, coming in 2023 on um, Marshall Lee publications in French first. Yeah, that's a long story. But um, anyway, uh, I went and go, in, and go into great detail what happened there. But uh, there was a time when the only person I really had problems with in the Yakuza um, got sued um, by the family of someone his men killed. And he paid, uh, he paid damages to the family. And then he fled to Cambodia. And I felt like, all right, you know, I'm, I'm probably a lot safer than I was before. Uh, it's, you know, it's interesting. There's a, there's a saying amongst the Yakuza, which is the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And, you know, once you figure out who is the enemy of your enemy and, and you make friends with them, life can be a lot less stressful. 
the, the Yakuza are quite interesting in the sense that, you know, they're not like the mafia, the Italian mafia, or the American mafia you know, that you read about in some videos and the movies about. It's a lot more organized. There's a lot more links with financial services, just passing out a fanzine. I don't think the mafia had a fanzine. Yeah, well, you, if you see at the front of it, like, yeah. you know, you can see that there's like, the, they'll have the, like, people outside the annual, like, monthly meetings, yeah. like reporters, and you know, that figures, you know, they name all the Yakuza, and all the bosses are there. I mean, if you want to study who they are, you can. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm ashamed to say I probably know you know the names and birthdays of Moriakas and I do my own relatives but you know it's an occupational hazard so it's I mean it, it comes it comes across as a very um, established you know connection right it's, it's it's almost like it's almost formalized what were the conditions that made it you know made that kind of link between financial services or between government and the Yakuza so formalized well one thing is that you know Japanese organized crime they all exist legally right their, their existence itself isn't illegal um, and for many years, there were no real laws re that prevented people from doing business with them. So, you know, the major organizations had a mixture of legitimate and illegitimate businesses. Um, and since you're running a legitimate business and it's not illegal to be a Yakuza, there's basically no way to stop them from doing it. Um, and that was how it existed for, for many, many years. And traditionally, a huge section of the Yakuza were gamblers, federations of gamblers. And if you're a gambler, um, then you know um, that things like the stock market are a great gamble if you have insider information, right? You know, the best gamblers have an in. You know, they have a, a card up their sleeve. And once they realized around 2000, around 2004, 2005, that the Japanese stock market had very lax checks and that everybody was interested in the internet, and these new venture companies, um, and that no bank would loan money to them, but the Yakuza would, uh, it didn't take them long to sort of make such inroads into the financial markets that I think in 2005 or 2006, the National Police Agency put out a white paper which said the Yakuza threatened the very financial foundations of Japan's economy. And you had companies like Goodwill Corporation, which were the darlings of um, U.S. investors, uh, you know, being appraised for huge amounts of money and people buying a lot of their stock. And that went very well until the Ministry of Health and Welfare took away their um, their labor license and they were also running old folks homes and they had the license taken away because they're Yakuza. I mean, they're basically backed by the Yakuza. They're not gonna run a legitimate business for very long. And before they collapsed, they bought, which was essentially another Yakuza labor dispatch company for a hundred million dollars. So it collapses, a hundred million dollars is already in the hands of organized crime. And, and the only people that suffered really were the investors. Um, th there was a time when it was spectacular how, how much they had infiltrated the business world. Why, why was that allowed to go on for so long? Uh, because the police were still uh, of this mindset that, you know, Yakuza were making their money shaking down prostitutes on the street or, you know, are selling drugs to lowlifes, um, are getting a cut back on construction projects. They just, they just didn't keep, you know, they didn't keep in touch with uh, the Yakuza. And Goro Tadamasa, um, I will have to say, was a brilliant businessman. I mean, he was really good at sort of funding these startup companies. Some of them legitimately take off and they, they would just leave a back door to take in revenue. Some they would build up, sort of pump and dump, that make the company successful. People would buy the stock and then, because it's boring to run a company, they would crash it. Before they would crash it, they would short sell it with another Yakuza front company they owned. So kind of brilliant. And you know, one time he was kind of like Richard Branson. He was the largest single shareholder of Japan Airlines. So I think there are a lot of, um, I would say, crazy, exciting stories, right, in the book. Um, and there have been some people, I, I would say, I guess, critics, um, who have come out and say, you know, started questioning the the authenticity of the stories. And I think someone said that, you know, everything there is all in your imagination, right? So as a as a journalist, as a reporter, obviously, the holy grail, you know, for you guys is accurate reporting. So. We're quite curious to know, um, not so much how you responded to that, because I think you did, you know, put out your sources and you sent over a bunch of emails that was also shared. But how do you feel about, you know, this point when people are sort of questioning, I guess, um, your work and your authority as a, as a journalist? Well, I mean, the first thing I want to say is like, study Japanese dumbass, because all the materials are right there. If you'd bother to read them, if you didn't have an agenda, you know, it's nothing is hidden. Um, you know, I do suffer a little bit for the fact that you don't get a byline on your materials. 
um, I had a French journalist write to me like, you know, I've gone through all the Yomiri Shimbun archives and you only have 115 articles with your name on them. And I'm like, do you know that people in Japan don't get their names attached to articles? I'm like, 115 articles is, is only have my name on them because the only way you get your name on an article is by writing an explainer for the opinion page. Then you get your name on it because I like people to know Okay, I'm really competitive. I mean, that may be a flaw, but when you've really scooped your competition in the newspapers, and, and it's very competitive, we used to really like get up in the morning and like look at each other's papers to see who had this story and who didn't have the story. And you want people to know, like, like I won that story, I own that story, and then I would write an explainer just so that my name would show up in the paper. So I'd be like, yeah, that's mine. Um, uh, you know, my response to to to, to these people are are uh, like the the docudrama makers who work for a certain particular television station. Um, no uh, names. No names. Uh, is, well, you know, go online. I put up a database of all my articles in Japanese and things I've written, supporting materials. If you, if you doubt it, there's a gigabyte of data there. Sift through it because I got nothing to hide. And if you want to see what a real Yakuza documentary is, you can watch the piece I made for Vice because that was done with people who were ethical, who were concerned about protecting sources. Um, and who wanted to fact check things and not make a drama, but actually make a documentary. Just a follow up on that. You've mentioned publicly before as well that there were times you felt you crossed the ethical lines of what a journalist typically uh, should do. What? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, actually, many, many times. Um, Why? I, I come from Columbia, Missouri, right? Um, first of all, I learned journalism in Japan, and, and uh, the rules are a little different, but. Uh, I come from Columbia, Missouri, which has this wonderful journalism school. So when the book came out, the local paper wrote a review of the book. And I was reading through the book. And I was reading through the review. And it had these lines, which I've almost memorized, which are like, you know, Jake Adelstein, well, growing up in Columbia, Missouri, never attended the journalism school here. Because if he had, he wouldn't have broken every single ethical rule that journalists are taught. He slept with sources. He blackmailed detectives for scoops. Um, he, he plowed through the garbage. He intimidated people. And I read that and I was like, am I doing something wrong? <laughs> because, you know, what I was taught was, you know, and, and maybe, I, maybe, maybe I didn't pay enough attention, but was, you know, the three rules are you write the truth by any means possible, you protect your sources, and if you can't protect your sources and write the truth, then you find new sources or you give up on the story. And so everything else seemed fair to me. Um, as time has gone on, I realized that, you know, the Western standards of what is acceptable are different from what Japanese standards are acceptable. But, uh, you know, I also taking information from Yakuza, right? I mean, information is their business, but they're only giving you information because it benefits them. They're either destroying their rivals or um, someone they tried to blackmail wouldn't pay up and they're passing that information on to you. But it doesn't mean the information is no good just means that they have a you know skin in the game so uh, there have been some great scoops I've gotten because I took information from those people and I and now I wonder what well, was that ethical or not I don't I don't know do you regret anything that you did uh, yeah I, I regret um, asking some people to look into things that they were clearly over their head um, but you know I can't change that so there we are and do you think that you know 30 years which is a Quite a long time of very focused crime reporting. How does has that you know changed you as a person? Well, thankfully, in recent years, my coverage of organized crime has diminished, and it's more politics and social issues. Um, I would have to say that the problem with spending, you know, I, I wrote my first story about the Yakuza for the newspaper actually in 1992. Um, so you could say I've been reporting on organized crime you know, on and off for 30 years. And the problem with Yakuza is there's such argument of people, and they're so good at picking a fight that you become very argumentative yourself. You know, it's like a a anything can be turned into a fight. You could say to me, you know, you know, good morning, Jake. And I'd be like, well, why is it a good morning? It's a good morning for you, but it's not a good morning for me. And, and you, know, you, know, you could say, I'm sorry. And I'm like, no, you're not really sorry. If you're really sorry, you wouldn't have said good morning in the first place. And you'd be like, you're right. I, I am really sorry. Like, no, that's not really a sincere, Sorry, and you know, that's just their specialty. They're always looking for a fight. So everything you say 
can be turned into a quarrel. Every, every, every conversation is a confrontation. Um, and there's a period of my life with it, I became very aggressive in the way I spoke with people or the conversations I had. So it's taken me a long time to sort of, to kill that. It sounds um, very stressful. It is stressful, it's stressful. It's like dealing with like a crazy girlfriend or a crazy boyfriend every day of your life for 30 years. Everyone has this thought about, you know, who's gonna play me on the Netflix show about my life? Who's now, gonna play you on your next Netflix show? <laughs> Shah Rukh Khan's a bit old, but if he, you know, like gets uh, a few years younger, then, then maybe he's a good one. You had an interesting answer to this earlier. I did. I picked uh, Kerry Washington from Scandal. I absolutely love her. If anyone knows who Kerry Washington is, yeah, I think I, she's slightly too tall for Nat, so maybe... Just, just the tall else. point, I think. That's right. she, yeah. could, she, could, she could sort of slouch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, well, you had the chance of having someone actually play, well, not Netflix, but on HBO, um, with Ansel Elgort playing you on the HBO show. And as, as an aside, um, I, I read that actually Daniel Radcliffe was supposed to play you on a film a few years ago, which, which ended up not happening. Um, did you have any say in who played you, and are you happy with you know, Ansel's uh, performance um, in the show? Um, first of all, I should say yes. Dan is really nice. Like He really wanted to do the role. He was really studying Japanese. I really like him. I'm sorry it didn't work out. Um, he's a really nice guy. I mean, just like, just like you would think he is, he is, really, he is even nicer. Um, and I'm sorry I, I turned him down when he asked me to go watch hockey with him and his girlfriend because I just don't watch sports. Um, there were maybe two or three candidates for, um, for the other Jake. Because I'm working on the show, I, I just, and it's so weird referring to Jake as Jake. You know, we, we, we sometimes say Taj, the other Jake. So there were other candidates for, for um, Jake, but Ansel was the most enthusiastic. I mean, he was really into it. I mean, he really, really wanted to do it. And he said that he would spend, you know, devote himself to learning Japanese. And it's obvious that he did. So Japanese I think he's great. Japanese on the show was fantastic. You, you, I mean, it, to me anyway, what do I know? But <laughs> no, no, no. You, it, not only is it great, he can do it. He did a press conference in Japan in Japanese and he was really, really good. Um, his dedication to the show is tremendous. Um, I did Aikido with the Tokyo Metropolitan Police Force. I knew, I, let me say, I was never any good. I'm terrible at martial arts, and especially at Aikido, but because uh, I did that, then Michael Mann also wanted Ansel to experience the same thing, so he trained. I mean, I, mean, I saw him crawl up the steps once after coming out of a practice. Um, that might have been because I told his teacher to give him a hard time because he'd been kind of a, a little hard to deal with one day, but, but still. Um, Ansel was very dedicated, so I, I think his performance is brilliant. He really does a good job. Does it feel strange seeing someone act like you? Do you give him a lot of notes about you know how you were during that time? No, no, I was like, Ansel, you know, it's a character in a drama. It's not me, you be you. You know, it has no relation to me. But um, as time went on, and I, I watched the series, uh, I stopped smoking cigarettes years ago, though. Um, you know, every now and then I am sorely tempted. And so once or twice he brought me like these clove cigarettes I used to smoke and he'd be like, you know, come on, Jake, you know, just, just one, you know, I mean, I went to the trouble of getting them. And I go, okay, it's all right. So and I'm watching the first episode and, and watching how he lights his cigarettes. Like, God, I was like, God damn, that's, that's me. I'm like, he's totally got that down. Uh, and my kid says that, you know, he has my mannerisms and these, so I don't see it, but uh, uh, apparently he does a very good job. Um, there are scenes in the show where, like, where you have the, the Jake character taking the examination or meeting the, the Katagiri family for the first time and the kids that are so close to how I remember it that it's like watching your life played by somebody else, which is very surreal. It's like having a, like having a flashback except you've been replaced and the people um, in that flashback have been replaced by other people. Um, so there's definitely that. Yeah, I think Ansel has done a wonderful job. So let's uh, talk a bit about Japan uh, as a whole. So I think Japan has a certain global perception, right? Great food, you know, very positive, great culture, uh, amazing place to visit and travel to. Um, but I think in a lot of your reporting, your book, um, as well as the TV show, focuses a little bit on some, I would say, well, some negative um, aspects mm. of Japan, right? 
uh, patriarchal hierarchy, hierarchies, xenophobia, a little bit of sexism as well. So what do you think about this, you know, dichotomy between um, the perception and the reality? And what is your personal view on it? Well, I mean, Japan is a very, is a very lovely place to live. Um, the hardcore values in Japan are reciprocity um, and politeness and decorum, and those are very nice things. Uh, it does have a problem in that misogyny is very deep rooted. I think Japan's gender equality rating is like 116 out of 147 countries. Freedom of press is, is now like Tanzania levels. Um, there's a lot of xenophobia. We really saw it come out in the COVID, in the COVID things with these ridiculous rules about who could enter and not enter. Even a permanent, and I'm a permanent resident of Japan, and basically I realized in March of 2020 that if I left the country, I couldn't come back. Um, and Japan's sort of xenophobic, nonsensical policies towards COVID separated families, husbands and wives, um, for no good reason. Um, and the Liberal Democratic Party, which has been basically ruling the country since the mid-50s, is hopelessly corrupt and hopelessly backwards. Um, however, even though there are support for them is very, very low, and voter turnout is very low, there's not a viable alternative party anymore. So you know, Japan seems to be stuck in this loop of incompetence and corruption with no one to replace the political powers that be. But yet you still love living there, yeah. and you plan to stay there for a long time? Uh, I mean, uh, well, I come from a country where, where Trump was the president for four years, what do you think? <laughs> Well, let's 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 talk about that. Um, you know, you you have you have written recently as well that you know Shinzo Abe was Trump before Trump. Yes. So, and he d he didn't deserve you know the lavish state state funeral and, 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 and so on. Uh, he, uh, seventy percent of the Japanese population believed he didn't deserve a state funeral. So I, I'm just one of the seventy percent. Fair enough. Can you dive deeper into that, um, into your reporting on Shinzo Abe and also um, a lot of the scandals that have kind of happened in the last few years? So. You know, Shinzo Abe, who was gunned down by a, um, by a, not a, well, not such a young man, by a man who wanted to demonstrate that um, Abe had strong political links to the Unification Church in South Korea, which is a, you know, the Unification Church is by many accounts, notice how I'm mincing my words here because they tend to sue people a lot, um, is by many accounts a problematic religious group that exploits um, and takes money from its followers, according to some. So he wanted to draw attention to that, um, which he did quite successfully. Um, but Shinzo Abe is basically uh, a politician um, whose grandfather was a war criminal, um, who basically raised Abe. And he wanted to um, rewrite history so Japan wasn't an aggressor in the Second World War. He wanted to return Japan to an imperial constitution. He wanted to throw out the American constitution, which he felt made the Japanese people weak and replace it with one that had no guarantee of basic human rights, no popular sovereignty, no, like, no actual democracy, and removed pacifism from the Constitution. And that was his lifelong dream, like kind of an obsession. It was his mother's obsession too. If you want to know how Shinzo Abe thinks, you should read some essays by his mother. Because when I read them, I was like, oh, well, I knew who the dummy was, but now I know who the ventriloquist is. You know, he was kind of fanatical and ruthless. and very much about benefiting his cronies and not concerned with ordinary people. I mean, just, he was raised with a silver spoon in his mouth and if you weren't um, born wealthy as well, he didn't care who you were or what happened to you. I mean, a, a, a career politician, very smart, very clever, very good at picking people to help him get what he wanted done, and a bully. And Abenomics, his much vouted uh, economics policy, um, not only failed, but we learned in the last two years that most of the success was based on falsified government statistics. I mean, it's so bad in Japan that in 2019, Nikkei did a poll of Japanese people, and uh, I think 79% said, we don't believe Japanese government statistics. So you know, that's kind of incredible when, you, when everybody knows that the government lies to you so much you can't even trust the economic data we have. And, and if, if there's a greatest, the greatest casualty of his reign is that um, people who lied, falsified documents to cover up his scandals were rewarded and those who told the truth um, were exiled or in some cases committed suicide rather than be complicit in a cover-up. 
Um, and you know, when, when the government can't tell the truth, or won't tell the truth, you have a serious problem in a democracy. How, how do you feel Japan moves forward with their uh, kind of a line drawn? Um, well, no one's asking me, but if they were to ask me, I'd say you're going to have to make people accountable. Um, if bureaucrats um, and government agencies falsify statistics or they lie, you're going to have to punish them under the law. Um, that would be a start. If there are consequences for um, deception, for making up data, um, and being corrupt, then people will stop doing that. And there are signs that with Abe gone that uh, Japan has taken that direction recently, and it hasn't been very reported here. The prosecution have been sweeping up um, people involved in Olympic bribery scandals, and they may even go after the, uh, the original um, investigation in France it has to do with um, Japan paying millions of dollars to former IOC officials to make sure Japan won the Olympic bid. And ironically, um, that money uh, was funneled through a company in Singapore called, I think, Black Tidings. It's not why I'm here, but uh, there is a Singapore connection to that. Has there, has there ever been any sporting uh, competition that's been won fair and square in recent times? Seems like uh, the World uh, Cup uh, and everything uh, else. Is... Uh, you mean the bidding? Yeah, it seems to be this. Some, some bribery scandals with almost every uh, sport. Uh, Allegedly, uh, sorry. Allegedly, <laughs> allegedly. Maybe one? I, I don't know. I'm not really into sports, but there's <laughs> at least one, right? Fair enough. Um, you've worked on many stories in your career so far. There's some pretty interesting ones. It's like we were just talking about the Olympic Committee. There were cover ups, um, you know, that on, from the Prime Minister's level and a variety of topics. There was stories around the Fukushima meltdown as well. Um, is there one story or a collection of stories that you're the most proud of? Um, I was very proud of the of the stories I wrote about human trafficking while I was with the paper, um, and uh, and and uh, I think that th th this has been nay nayed by some internet troll, but I'm going to say it anyway because it's true. Um, the International Labour Organization, which is part of the United Nations, did a very good study of human trafficking in Japan, and it basically said Japan. This was like 2004. Uh, it says Japan punishes the victims doesn't punish the traffickers and the laws are weak um, and the criminals use those laws to bring in women and exploit them and the government's uh, attitude towards it and their countermeasures are totally insufficient so the Japanese government paid for that study and then they told the ILL do not publish it so you know and because I keep track of these things it has good to have a good memory I just kept knocking on doors until someone gave me a copy of it and then we ran it on the front page of the Yumiuri Shimbu in the evening edition and it was so embarrassing to the Japanese government that they revised their plan of action and actually made better laws to counter human trafficking and the results are that human trafficking is a very minor issue in Japan at the moment so that's probably the, the thing I'm most proud of that you know uh, doesn't have anything to do with the Yakuza but it did have an effect in resulting in good legislation. Is that what motivates you or drives you as a journalist? Is it to put out something that will actually have material change, positive material change, or is it really just, just want to report the facts? 5% um, of the time, I mean, if, if you're a journalist, you're lucky, 5% of the time what you do matters. It actually makes a positive change to society, and that feels great. You feel like you've really accomplished something. But the other 95% is just bullshit. You're just amusing people. Or, you know, maybe you're correcting some things or, or maybe you're just, you know, just competing to see if you can have what somebody else does right. What motivates me, what keeps me doing it is that 5%. But you also have to keep in mind that 95% of what you do as a journalist is just filling space. We're going to ask some quick fire questions. Yeah. Um, do you want to go first? Yeah. All right, so. So just answer in a couple of sentences little bit more fun stuff like, like haiku like brevity I can do that <laughs> why not okay what's the most bizarre situation you've ever found yourself in please don't see this moment right here <laughs> um, quick fire question oh okay all right uh, most bizarre situation I, uh, um, most bizarre situation I ever found myself in is that I was doing a uh, um, a photo shoot for a magazine, 
and the person I was doing photo shoot with is dominatrix and she she pinned me down on the tummy and I didn't know what to do Ooh. but uh but this is for public viewing so we'll stop there okay next one <laughs> what's your biggest regret uh my biggest regret is that um, uh, I didn't take a cushy job with Google when they offered me one. Mistake? Biggest, mis biggest, biggest mis mistake, okay. Biggest mistake, probably, because I'd be really wealthy. Right <laughs> Alright, what does a typical day look like for you? Right now, I'm working on this podcast about missing people. So the first thing I do is get up in the morning, I look at the scripts, I look to see what appointments we have, who we're going to talk to, um, then I go over transcripts because while it's a doc, while the, the, the title is Gone with the Gods, The Evaporated, um, Kamikakushi, it's a long title. Um, all the interviews are done in Japanese and then they have to be transcribed, translated in English, and then I have to find voice actors for them. So me and Shoko Plombeck, who's my co-host, that's what we're working on all the time. So I basically get up in the morning, look at scripts, look at transcripts, go to interview, record the interview, record the after notes, and then um, in the evening, if my girlfriend's free, we go out to dinner, um, and go to the gym and I go to sleep. Like it repeats endlessly. Doesn't matter whether it's Monday or Tuesday or, or Saturday or Sunday. She has a weird, weird schedule. Um, that's my, that's all I'm doing these days. Uh, in, unless like the prime minister gets assassinated or something. Then you send your daughter to go cover that. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I confess, when uh, Shinzo Abe was shot, my daughter was interning with me for the summer and I was in Hokkaido going to private detective school um, for this podcast. So I sent my daughter to the, to the scene of crime. Her and her best friend. How old is um, she? Imari. She was like, she's 20, 21 at the time. I was like, okay, you on the Shinkansen in 30 minutes, go to the scene, grab my business cards, and then head to the police station. Favorite food? Favorite food? Uh, it's coming to me. Uh, Agidashi tofu. It's kind of like this fried tofu dish. I really like it. It's really tasty. Favorite Singapore food since you're in Singapore now? Favorite? Singapore food. Oh! chicken rice it symbolizes the 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 uh, the harmony between various ethnicities and cultures in, in in Singapore and it tastes really good too three different sauces I, I once used that as a speech in high school um, to get elected as student council president um, I was like yeah so the teachers are you know like the chicken and then, like, <laughs> you're the rice and then I'm the chili sauce and mixes everything together so I that that analogy plays it really does yeah Thank you. Did, did you get elected yes I did okay well the, <laughs> and chicken rice it's my favorite uh, also the, the, you can use also, garlic naan too also I know it's supposed to be a short answer that that that, that weird salted Salted, salted egg thing. Yeah, I love those. That those are really good. Now we have salted egg everything. Yeah, yeah. salted Crab, egg everything. Chips, fries. Yeah, salted egg, salted egg duck, duck skin, potato chip things. Love those. And our client does that. So. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Can, those are yeah. delicious. Tavi, do you have free samples for Jake? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Please, like I would like a giant bag of them. <laughs> what, what do you do to get your mind off work? Um, reporting. <laughs> Uh, well, um, you only do that so many times a day. Uh, I meditate or I go to the gym. Why are your books selling so well in France? Um, one is because French readers are highly intelligent and appreciate good writing. And also, um, France really loves Polar. Polar is their the genre for, tri for, for true crime, crime, mystery novels in general. Um, and they really love Japan. Um, so there's this kind of like wonderful Venn diagram where like love of Japan, love of crime novels comes together um, and I fit into that very nicely. Um, I'll say this too really quickly. What I also really like about France is uh, I published like three books there and the third book, I Sold My Soul for Bitcoins, um, has nothing to do with Yakuza or, or the Japanese underworld. And when I went on a book tour, people came up to me and said like, it's so nice to see you write something that doesn't have anything to do with those tattooed people. You've grown as a writer. And I was like, oh, it was like everybody was like my mother. It was like, it's, it's so good. Like you can write about more than just like, you know, gangsters. Um, last quick quiet question. Um, why did you change your name from Josh to Jay? In, in high school, um, uh, they misprinted my name and I, I, I matured rather late so I still had kind of a squeaky voice even in high school and I was like 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 my name's not J Jake it's Josh and then my friends were like oh no no he's lying <laughs> he just likes to be he doesn't like his name <laughs> it's Jake it's Jake and then my she's like it's Jake and then it stuck by the end of the day it was like I was like well why fight it you know and so I've kept it ever since is it, is it legally 
legally Jake now? Or is no, still- no, I, I it will never be legally Jake while my mother is alive. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure my mom's not listening to this. Maybe afterwards I might change it, but right but now it's going to stay. Most people refer to you as Jake or Josh. Most people refer to me as Jake. Okay. Um, my mother refers to me as Josh, and my sister. Jackie, or when she wants to get under my skin, she calls me by my full name, Joshua Lawrence. Um, other than that, everybody calls me Jake. All right, so so I think we're coming almost to the close of the session. Um, what is the next chapter for the Jake, Josh, Edelstein story? So you're working on this new podcast on missing people. You've got a new book coming out. Um, the next thing I have to do is, so Tokyo Private Eye will be released next year. Um, this book I wrote a long while back has been updated. The last the Yakuza will probably or the last Yakuza will probably be out this year in English. Yes, um, the podcast will also be done this year. So next year, um, I'm keeping my goals very low. I need to, um, you know, I am a Zen Buddhist priest, but I'm really low ranking. And if I don't grade up, and you know, deep into my spiritual practice, I'm going to get kicked out in two or three years. So I need to really focus on that. Um, and then maybe. I'll start writing a fifth book, title not yet known. What's the title? Sorry, I'm, I'm not saying the title yet. It's a secret. Um, and I guess one last last question from okay. me. Um, Tokyo Vice season two is coming out. Um, are you looking for any extras for the show, specifically six foot two, three Indian men? No. If if, if, if we are, yeah. I will put the casting director in touch with you immediately. Perfect. But my actual question. Um, are there any spoilers that you can share? What do we expect for season two coming up? Um, the questions that are left unanswered at the end of season one will definitely be answered. Um, you will see an evolution in the way that the police um, and the press start to deal with the Yakuza as they become more powerful. Um, and that that tension is incredibly interesting and based on reality and not something that uh, people in a writer's room pulled out of their ass. So it should be very engaging. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, round of applause, please, for Jake Addison.